Hello everyone, my name is Zenitsu and I'm back with another Digimon video. So today's going to be a little bit different and this is going to be one of my more topical videos and it is a video that I've been trying to figure out how to actually do for a while as I feel like this is kind of important because this is just my opinions on the problems that I'm currently having with the Digimon TCG. When it comes to my opinions, it, it is just that. I am a designer, so I do have some insight into game design and game balance as a whole, and there's things that I'm not necessarily agreeing with when it goes to the current pace and direction of the Digimon. Digimon TCG. The idea is to reflect on the data and trends that we've seen in the past couple of years in the game and highlight them and have a discussion on their flaws and possible solutions. So this is not necessarily me trying to attack a Bandai or complain about the meta. This is, again, just things that I've noticed that aren't necessarily for the game's overall benefit, in my opinion. So with all of that out of the way, starting things off, I understand that balance is impossible, but it doesn't hurt to try to at least maintain some semblance of balance. All TCGs of the competitive nature face a never-ending challenge of balance. It's a perpetual dilemma where you need to somehow achieve two mutual divergent outcomes at the same time. That being maintaining a semblance of a stable meta for players to feel rewarded for the time, effort, and money invested into the game, while also keeping the game ever-changing, not to incur stagnation and eventual exhaustion, which we've already seen and experienced a couple of times with the whole feast and famine schedule releases that they tend to like to do. There's been a fine line between too much of an impactful change and too little. Sadly, attempt to find a perfect balance may be close to impossible due to the nature of competitive games. Players tend to foster animosity towards the meta more than acceptance the longer they play, especially as the game gets more and more developed. So this leads into uh, growing frustrations. Players tend to get frustrated when a handful of decks cement uh, themselves in the upper echelon of tier lists. It's more likely for players to not be happy with the top tier decks than the inverse. Not uh, everyone plays the top tier decks, and it can be very frustrating depending on the power gap between tier lists to play against them. This isn't necessarily uh, the first time it's happened with the Digimon TCG, where players have been dissatisfied with how the game has developed in specific metas. Just a couple off the top of my head is people weren't necessarily thrilled with BT-05 Lord Nightmon, BT-06 Gabubond, BT-07 Blue Hybrids, BT-9 and BT-10 Metal Garumon X, BT-11 Black War Greymon, so on and so forth, with the last big example being EX-5 Anubismon, just to name a few on the English side of the game. Why does this keep happening? It's almost like Digimon is destined to always have an unpleasant few decks every few sets. One of the main points of this video and discussion is to discover why it happens and why it happens so consistently. So this all comes from, well, what makes a deck top tier? So fundamentally, it comes down to two primary factors. The first one is being what options the deck has available to it. No, I'm not talking about the option card type. I'm talking about just availability of tools that the deck has access to. And then the second big primary factor is going to be the interactions that the deck has and mechanics it's playing with. So when it comes to the options that it has, the first aspect of options being uh, the more favorable assortment of tools and mechanics you have, the better your deck is probably going to be performing, especially against other decks. Mechanics can be broken down in a couple of rudimentary ways. So you have a draw and search power, which helps with the overall consistency of the deck. Abilities and keywords being used, which is basically how the deck wants to function and what it's being able to play with. And then you have some even simpler things like the stats of the card and various other aspects like that. There's more to options than just the mechanics it's working with, but it's how it's applying them, such as its overall speed and tempo because of its draw and search power on top of resource generation, damage output, recovery, combo potential, defensive capabilities, protections, and many more. 
The second aspect uh, of what makes a deck strong interactions is what determines a relative uh, healthiness of options. So seldomly is it ever just the mechanics or properties itself that determine whether it's a problem, rather what can be done with it and what the opponent can do in response to it if they can do anything at all. Right now, there are certain aspects of the game that are just straight up hard to interact with, giving a huge advantage to those who could use and abuse the uh, limited amount of interactions versus uh, the uh, decks that can't. So some of these include delay options, the trash zone, tamers, cards with protection, and then uh, just cards that can come out of nowhere or just cards that grant too much advantage like memory gaining free playing cards and even cost reduction. So when a deck has uh, many options on how it could use their cards and there are fewer to no answers to stop or punish the usage, uh, the better a deck is generally going to perform. The interactions aspect is what separates good design from bad design. It's possible to have good strengths, but they need to be balanced with some kind of weakness or deficiency, which is how decks and cards should be designed. A really good baseline example is a really strong and powerful card usually is going to have a high cost associated with it because the impact is so high. But as more of a concrete example, this is why ace cards are, well, really good. Ace cards do something uh, really, really strong and usually have disruptive uh, capabilities, but the balance uh, between it from being an overly powerful card is the fact that it is accompanied with the overflow mechanic. So when the card leaves the field in any way, shape, or form, the opponent is going to be gaining uh, memory, uh, putting the cost on the back end. Ace cards also have very specific setups and are usually telegraphed at times, and there's specific windows uh, that you could learn uh, to play around to not fall victim to what ace cards can do, leaving actual room for counterplay. The point on these examples are the fact that uh, every question should have an answer. Everything needs some form of weakness uh, or cards to be able to interact with it for that counterplay to be formed. Digimon sometimes fails at uh, finding a good middle ground when it comes to actually trying to balance their cards. When it comes to some decks and some cards, the privileges afforded to them and their potential weaknesses that they may have, there's a clear gap between what is good and what is not. This might be because the design team is not known for their knowledge and competitive balance. This is blatantly presented mostly because they don't keep all decks and all cards in the same power scaling whether that's by accident or not. If a deck has several strengths, then it should have about the same number of weaknesses to be able to balance it out. What would then determine if one deck was stronger than the other is the combination of those strengths that they have. But this isn't true as some decks have more strengths than weaknesses and others the inverse. It can be harder to comprehend the value of the strengths and weaknesses and how they're generally given out, especially when their values change from situation to situation. So those situation changes is what basically forms matchups. So the concept of the changes in the strengths in the weaknesses uh, decks face against each other is what helps determine and define matchups. The strongest uh, decks uh, can do so much and get away with so much without having to do that much. The reward for using the best uh, is uh, far higher than uh, the same effort being put into a lesser deck. If two decks are doing the exact same thing, the one that's doing it the best and the easiest will generally be the one that sees more play and performs better overall. This is what determines the meta after all. What are the best ways to go about playing against a deck you can't interact with? Well, the answer is to just not interact at all. This mentally only puts the players in a feel bad and losing situation more often than not, as there's little that they actually could have done to change the outcome of the game. Player versus player games are all about interaction. The less interactable things are, 
only makes uh, the game less enjoyable to play, let alone watch. Interaction is the whole point of games of this type to begin with. There's nothing more rewarding than facing a challenge and overcoming it through hard work, practice, and creativity. But uh, there's a difference between uh, something being challenging and something being suffocating. So how does all of this relate to the current state of Digimon? So Digimon as of late has made some very questionable and very interesting design choices over the past couple of sets. I feel like most of this kind of started with BT14 as BT14 is the start of a new block and usually with the new block comes a new design philosophy that goes behind the cards throughout the rest of the year. They're doing a pretty good job at maintaining the ban and restriction list, keeping it up to date and to trying to uh, fix the game and to take the problem cards out. But the fact that the same mistakes are being made over and over again is just still a very alarming thing to me. Digimon does have a couple of problems, mainly with controlling its resource system, knowing how fast they even want the game to move, understanding how players are even going to be using their cards, and making abilities that actually need counterplay, and right now there's a ton of them that currently don't have any. Right now, the game has a couple of different cards and effects that are in desperate need of something in some way to be able to interact with them in order to have some better counterplay for them. These currently are, again, in my opinion, delay options, tamer cards, the trash, and I would kind of say the raising or breeding area, but that one's a little bit harder to mess around with, so I'm kind of just going to be leaving that off, but I am aware of the uninteractability with the raising area as a whole. So let's start off with delay options. So delay options are options that are basically just two-fold cards where you play the card, use its main ability, and then it usually has some way to be able to sit into the battle area to be able to use a secondary ability on a later turn. And that secondary ability is basically a ticking time bomb in terms of some added extra value, usually for free. When a card is set up onto the battlefield this way, there is actually no way for it to leave the battlefield other than to use it currently in the game, which is a huge problem. Sure, you could play some floodgates and have some cards that would normally turn off or de-incentivize the use of those delay options, but once the thing that's stopping them is no longer there, the delay option becomes just as threatening as it was uh, before you even played the floodgates to slow them down to begin with. We already have a problem with tamer cards, and these are less interactive than tamer cards. Their current use incentivizes sitting, waiting, doing nothing, and lining up delay options and effects to go off almost consecutively for extra powerful turns, usually resulting in the end of the game, if not close to the end of the game. They're good enough to even replace tamers outright in some situations on how explosive they can make swing turns and the value that they're given. They also are so good that they seem to have power crept normal options, out from being used as they don't really do that much in comparison to delayed based options. The advantage decks get for running normal options usually is going to come down to removal or alternative ways to win if they're going to be running normal options at all, otherwise there's zero downside why you shouldn't be running any delay based options. The next problem child is going to be tamers. So while tamers are seeing more interactions than what we had before, it's still kept to a minimum, which allows decks that rely on tamers to still have little to no answer when you're playing against them. Tamers tend to have a reoccurring effect that consistently generates some form of advantage or being used in some alternative means that Digimon cards can use, resulting in them always having some form of value. This isn't a bad thing, but when specific card combos uh, need or use tamers, there's a little way to actually stop them if you're not one of the decks that actually has ways to interact with tamers, which is part of the problem to begin with. It now makes those combos borderline uninteractable, like a lot of the delayed based options and how you're setting those up and the fact that there's no counterplay to them. 
any kind of specific uh, card type removal that isn't obviously creature or monster focused uh, must be done very carefully as too much of it can actually ruin the card type. But some more uh, removal for specific card types uh, wouldn't hurt to always have an option good enough to try to keep the different card types like tamers and delay based options in check. And speaking of keeping things in check, the uh, last uh, problem child that I'm going to be talking about more specifically is the trash. So right now, the trash is a zone that some decks uh, can use and act basically like a secondary resource system. Once it's set up, it rarely needs to do it again, because when cards are used or deleted, guess where they go? That's right, right back into the trash ready to be reused, never really losing any value once it's already there. It's always important to make sure if something is interacting with a specific zone, it's a good idea for both players to be able to have access and interact with that same zone to level the playing field in some capacity. Just as an example, Magic the Gathering does this by always having Grave Hate cards when they're going to be having a Grave base set either in the exact same set or one set before or after. So that way they always have the answer to the problem that's going to be emerging. The security for yellow can be used like the trash can be used for a color like purple or black, but security is actually somewhat more fair in comparison because of uh, some inherent limitations that's done with it. Some of the inherent limitations uh, that security has is the randomness that comes from it. it there's fewer cards going in and inversely out of security, and the opponent actually has some base level of interaction with the security because it's the health system of the game and they can just attack the health to mess around with the security or abilities that are able to remove cards from security. That isn't saying yellow can't or isn't abusing security because it can and it does. So security, uh, security is definitely a hot topic of the game. It's definitely a zone, as I just mentioned, that you could interact with, but security does have its own built-in and native problems. As I already said, security is the health system of the game. In its current form, it'll never not be an issue with the game, and it's one of the worst things about Digimon in general. This problem is exemplified by two major factors, one, security triggers, and two, recovery. Security triggers uh, have a multitude of different style of effects. The most uh, game warping one of these is uh, the immediate impact uh, attached to it for basically using it for free. So with some cards like removal options, uh, this can easily turn the tide of the game with uh, almost a zero input or skill involved by either player. This creates a negative feeling that let players feel basically luck sacked in and out of games. No matter how well a player could have played and how well they have done their risk analysis and mitigation, that can only get someone so far. Recovery is single-handedly one of the most powerful mechanics because of the flaw with security to begin with. Healing as a mechanic uh, is nothing new, especially nothing new to any TCG, but when healing gives you uh, the extra potential at a game warping advantage in addition to that heal, because of how security triggers work, that's when things start to not feel very fun. What they need to do is start dialing down security triggers to have less free game defining impact uh, and put uh, more restrictions on healing. This uh, becomes a bigger issue as security is transitioning into also being used as a resource system, which means we have more ways to reg and use and abuse security than we ever had before. But there's more issues that I'm having with the game than just specific zones or card types. I'm talking about stuff like tempo. So what do I mean by tempo? Well, tempo to me is referred to efficiency versus impact. Decks obviously want to move as fast and efficiently as they possibly can, while also having as much impact at the same time. Digimon tends to try to cheat on its own tempo in three different ways to make cards cost less and decks move faster inversely. So the three ways is going to be memory gaining, cost reduction, and, well, the most infamous of all of them, free playing of cards. 
All three of these things speed up the pace of the game and a deck's overall tempo, and when done poorly, it basically undermines the base resource system of the game, which is one of the biggest draws to the game compared to every other TCG on the market. Cards have a cost associated with them for a reason, which is what makes them fair and balanced in the first place, at least that's the idea. Lining up instances of ways to be able to cheat on tempo can lead to making cards cheaper or free to climb the stages or even hard play them. When using these kinds of effects, it can make ineffective cards even more effective, or it can make already effective cards even better. Not paying for playing cards is already very strong, but when it's combined with the ability to actually gain resources for using the card that normally would have a cost associated to them is when tempo problems start emerging. Most of the bans and limits were actually because they offered too much tempo advantage or enabled something that was already good enough on tempo to be abused by other strong cards to make them overperform. Bandai still seems to struggle with this, and it is the most common mistake they seem to make. So uh, this change in tempo actually changed the pace of the game, and it's natural that it's going to change over time, but uh, Digimon uh, used to be a game where they based a lot of possible playlines around having three memory in mind. With uh, the recent sets, it seems they slowly changed it from needing three memory to make your plays possible to now only needing one memory to make your plays possible due to the hyper-efficiency of the cards that they were making. This speed change helps make games feel less interactive as there's more pressure and emphasis on abusing the mechanics in the game, especially the uninteractive parts, early on to be able to gain you that initial advantage. Without uh, a way to slow them down and interact with them, games uh, can feel out of control. The faster the deck moves compared to one another only gives the faster deck a obvious clear advantage as Digimon rewards more proactive plays than reactive ones. Both stack-based decks and hard-based decks got different tools to be able to make them consistent and faster based on some of the new cards that they've designed. The scary thing is if a deck is already operating off of uh, this new baseline, where can they actually go from here? So when it comes to the introductory of these true staples, because Digimon really didn't have any true staples before. Sure, you had your archetype-based staples, but you didn't have any game-warping staples that every deck wants or needs. And I feel like these true staples only hurt the game overall. Before, there was no universal cards that every deck has to have, and as a result, that actually helped keep the monetary cost of decks down, let more cards be playable, and actually acted as a tool to help control the power balance and dynamics of the game as decks were designed around not having them. The sad thing is, uh, the staples that we do have now are doing exactly the thing Bandai has been trying not to do, and what got cards banned and limited in the first place, which is that shift in tempo. So one thing I've noticed after looking at a whole bunch of different card games is games like Dragon Ball Super Masters and Yu-Gi-Oh! seem to have a very similar deck formula despite being completely different games based on the over-reliance of these true staple cards because of what they do and what they mean for their respective games. So just looking at any deck of these two games, about one-fourth or more of these decks are designed and dedicated to these staple cards at this point. Because these staple cards are so good and widely used, it is warping the game around the usage of them, and Digimon is slowly headed towards that same direction, as more are being added. So I know I kind of just rambled a lot and just talked about the current issues that I'm having with the game and just things that I've noticed in general, but how would I actually go about fixing them? Because, you know, I just listed a whole bunch of problems with no real solutions, so this is kind of where the solutions portion comes in. So in terms of the issues with staples, well, 
The solution is just to gut them, get rid of them. Whether that's banning or limiting them doesn't matter. They shouldn't be printed and they shouldn't print anymore without extensive testing. Then uh, when it comes to uh, fixing the lack of interactions, well, again, the solution is pretty simple. Just add more interactions. So whether that's going to be uh, adding cards that can interact with delayed options, adding more cards to interact with tamers, and actually adding cards to interact with the trash, doesn't matter. We still need just more ways to be able to interact with some of the less interactive elements of the game. So I know this was kind of a long one, and this was a very dense video, but here's just some of my closing thoughts. There is a saying when uh, playing at a casino, and that is the house always wins, meaning you're guaranteed to lose, uh, so why even bother playing? Well, playing against the top decks sometimes can feel like that, and well, that's just the way it is in any TCG. And unfortunately, right now, the power gap and the usage of the promos and all of the new tempo tools and design changes only favor the top decks and widen that gap more than it shortens them, which is unfortunate. Even though we do have a widespread of meta decks readily available to us, it is just very concerning when it gets too condensed. So I wish Digimon finds a way to course correct. By no means do I think that uh, their recent design is going to kill the game off, but I do think that if nothing is done, uh, it will put the game on a path it might not be able to recover from, only making it less enjoyable overall. And even though players are always going to find something to complain about, uh, and even if Bandai does listen, that just means we'll complain about something else, this shouldn't really dissuade Bandai for wanting to listen and cater to their audience, because it gives this open communication that allows the game to be able to grow into something more special, knowing that our feedback is actually getting heard and responded to. So this leads me to the question on, well, what do you all think? Do you agree with my stance, or do you think that there's different problems with the game that I might be overlooking? Feel free to share in the comments below, and that's all I have for today's video, and I hope you really enjoyed it, and uh, it would mean a lot if you would leave a like and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that uh, notification bell to stay up to date on all my future content. Feel free to check out uh, my other content if you already haven't. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you all next time.